Welcome to the Recruitment Mentors Podcast. My name is Hisham Azuz. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Tom Ponting, who is the founder of Amber Resourcing, who are a tech specialist recruitment agency. Tom started his recruitment career in 2006, working in finance recruitment, but then joined a 10-person IT team at Opus Recruitment in 2010, where he progressed through the ranks from consultant all the way to regional and managing director, where he was then responsible for a business unit generating around 30 million in turnover before he then uh, left Opus to start Amber Resourcing in 2019. Um, in this time, he's been back to scale and grow Amber Resourcing. They currently have 11 people in the business, but have ambitious plans to grow the business across the UK and look to get to the 60, 90 people uh, mark over the next few years. So, Tom, thank you for joining me. No, thank you. Thank you for the lovely intro as well, mate. <laughs> no worries. So where I always like to start, and the first question I have for you, Tom, is in your opinion, what characteristics and traits do you think make up a highly successful recruitment consultant? Yeah, okay. So I think it's not really a trait, if you like, or characteristic, but it's... um. The, the, the first thing for me is like hard work. Um, like mm. I bring it right back to the, the basics of the best people that I've worked with um, within the first six months of joining the business have probably been the people that have put in the most amount of effort. And it's like, it's a, it's a really like easy core cool thing that anyone can really do. But the people that tend to put the most amount of effort hit the KPIs early doors that 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 they they seem to be the people that that, that work out the best um so hard work being one of them resilience is another one um i'd say to anyone that's joining or looking to get into recruitment the first six months that i mean there'll, there'll definitely be tears at, at some point or another and if there aren't tears you're probably not pushing yourself hard enough um <laughs> and uh, and so the resilience of being in a position where like you're just not letting things affect you for more than a day. The, the, the all I have is like, yeah, if, if, if something goes wrong, like let it affect you, like, like let it hurt a little. But when you come in the next day, make sure, yeah, make, make sure you, you leave that the door and, and you come in as a fresh day and we're, we're kind of going again. So that's the that's the kind of two kind of cool ones. Consistency is what makes what takes good billers to great billers. And these are the guys that and girls that 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 get to a position where. You know the consistency of the bad months are you know, still still sticking in a deal or two, um, and then obviously the good months are, are more. So consistency is another one, and I also think the ability to actually listen and and take a step back and understand something. Um, mm. And I think listening is such a underrated um, underrated skill to have as a as a recruiter, or not underrated but underused, if you like. So just just before we carry this on, I, I love the fact that you brought up consistency. D just keen to to sort of zoom in on that quickly because I think everyone listening to this wants to be more consistent, right? Yeah. I guess look, you would you would you would have seen so many recruiters in your time. Yeah. So I guess when when I say to you a great consistent biller, what I, what are the sort of top three things you think that they sort of do day in? day out, week out, that maybe some people don't do that could prevent them being consistent? Yeah, okay. Well, uh, speaking from, from experience, the when I say consistency, it's coming in and doing the same actions. It's like, it's like, again, it sounds really like simple and easy. But so many times I've been with consultants where they've, they've had a, a superb month, they've, they've got this massive commi commission check at the end of the month, and the next month, they're just, just not the races. They're, they're, they're doing whatever, they, whatever they're doing with their money, but they're, they're not coming back and not following the same actions. I think a lot of recruitment is, is quite like mathematical in terms of the numbers and what you have to do to achieve the end result, being at two, three, four, whatever deals per month. So the consistency is actually the, the actual, the actual um, work you put in um, throughout the course and the rest of the inputs. Um, if you do the same amount of inputs on most months, the outputs will be what the inputs um, dictated. So that that's what I mean by consistency. It's actually some some consultants will have one month and um, they'll be superb and uh, they'll get the, the big commission check. They'll, they'll do 30, 40, 50K whiteboard and then they'll go off the boil and you'll see the game in, in two or three months' time. 
So mm. just, just having that level consistent input would be yeah, would be a would be the focus. Yeah, so yeah, so I think you're talking a bit about getting complacent there as well. And I think I think the other thing that you're talking about there, which I think is really interesting, is because straight away we're now talking about just just uh it's come up a few times now, but just a word that people for whatever reason have tarnished, which is KPIs, right? But it's yeah. it's what you said. The, it's actually well, no, it's actually understanding the science behind what you need to do that will give you yeah. the best chance of achieving the outcomes that you need. So yeah. I think that I'm, I'm glad you highlighted that because I think I think that's the way it needs to be sort of positioned, isn't it? It's like, well, okay, so you've done fifty grand this month. Like, let's have a. Do you understand why you was able to do that? Like, yes, you are good and you have talent and these things, but do you actually know why you think you was able to achieve that? And I think that's what you're talking to, isn't it? It's the yeah. best recruiters understand the science that they need to sort of put in each month that can give them the best chance. Yeah, I think when people mention KPIs, they they kind of crease up a little bit. They're like, oh my god, KPIs! Um, but what do you actually break it down? It can be used, like you said, on such a positive a positive angle. So, okay, well, how have you done this 50K? What has mm. enabled you to do that? And then you track it back and you look at the KPIs and you go, okay, well, that's if you want to do 50K again, here's your platform to, to, to do it. And if you haven't done it, then we need to maybe inspect the quality in which you're doing it at. So, yeah, I think, I mean, going back to, to starting up and, and, and doing this with, with Amber and starting doing billing myself, it's like I needed KPIs. I needed to know what what I needed to mm. do to, in order to get my two or three deals over the course of the month. So, yeah, I think KPIs are, are really underrated in terms of, I think, again, people crease up a little bit and get nervous and scared of, of a KPI, but it's um, it should be a recruiter's best friend. And, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think yeah, if you're if you're listening to this straight away, it's like let make sure you've looked at look like, this quarter, last quarter, last month. Like you, you should be able to answer the question with your manager, with yourself. Right, okay, how did I achieve that? What are sort of the core things that I need to do? And I think that's what you've highlighted quite quickly. So amazing. Yeah. So how just to frame this up for people, so obviously for the last coming towards 18 months, you've um been a recruitment business owner, right? Of Amber yeah. Re- Amber Resourcing. So obviously slightly different journey there, but and then Obviously, um, before that, you was an employee, but obviously got to the position where you're managing P&Ls, teams, etc. So let, we're going to start there and sort of break some of that down, and then we'll go into Tom, the business owner. So I guess how would you, and feel just whatever comes up for you naturally, but like how would you describe like your uh, sort of early on in recruitment for you? How would you describe it? I'm always interested. Yeah, um, I, I, I just, yeah, I absolutely love that. I think I'm one of those people that uh, I think a lot of people fall into recruitment, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Whereas, whereas as soon as I, I got, I got a, an understanding of what recruitment was, I, I always wanted to get into recruitment. It was like it was my dream job. Um, Using insurance, was it using insurance yeah. sales or something before? Yeah, yeah same. Yeah, yeah. So I, I actually, um, I first got wind of it when I, I used to play for a, a football team and. Um, and one of the guys was a, was a guy called Nigel Romana, who um, is one of the, the senior people at Opus. And we're in the changing room. He said, listen, I think you'll be quite good at recruitment because you know, of your attitude and, and your ability to communicate and whatnot. Um, and I looked a little bit further into it. And I actually, I actually dropped out of college. And, and back in those days, and those days are so really old, but back in those days, it was a case of you, you usually had to be a graduate to get a chance at, at some of the yeah, yeah. companies. It was a little bit tougher to get into. Um, so I uh, seek some advice and I said, well, get some sales experience behind you. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, with, with some sales experience over a prolonged period of time, then you've got, you know, a much better chance. So, yeah, that, that's what I did. Uh, I went and did a, did a few years in insurance sales and then uh, got an opportunity to, to come up to Bristol and uh, an interview for a for a recruitment business, but yeah, I th- I honestly think I was born and made for this. We've, we've, really? Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. I I can't I can't think of myself doing anything else. Uh, <laughs> so it's uh, a much better. So, better. so for, but, first few years, then obviously you obviously clearly had the passion for it, but were were they rocky? Were they good? Did you was it a duck to water? <laughs> what? How would you describe yeah. it? Like like a duck to water again. I'm t- taking it back to the KPIs. I like I'm I'm, I'm quite a simplistic man. He's like you, you tell me what needs to be done and and, <laughs> and, and, I'll, and I'll do it. And I, and I sat down on my first job and, and I said, well, hit these figures and, and do these numbers and, and you'll do X. And I just just did exactly that. I stuck my head down and 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 uh, I, I did the numbers and I did the numbers probably and fifty percent more. And lo and behold, you know, within 
in the, my first position, I was you know the, the, the top billet there for for two and a half, three years, and then the, you know the, the call up um, came when I went to Opus, and exactly the same thing happened there. So yeah, there, there was there was no kind of rocky rocky moments at all because I, again I followed the process that someone gave me, I followed their their instructions and the numbers that they that they said I needed to hit. Okay, so let, let's just hone in a bit on the sort of Opus journey then. Um, so obviously from what I can see, which I think is interesting and, and you may speak to recruiters now doing this to be fair, or you, or you may have at some point in your career, but obviously I saw that you had to transition from finance to tech, right? So yeah. I think sometimes recruiters listening to this may go through that or could be quite worried about that. So I guess, so sort of looking back at that, I guess, did you find anything difficult about transitioning into a different sector? What did you do to give yourself the yeah. best chance of having a good start? I don't know. How would you describe that change and what would your advice be yeah. for someone that would be well, transitioning? First of all, I, I must admit that that was my biggest reservation. I was shit scared. I was like, yeah, I come from a finance background where it, it's it's not fairly easy, but but it was fairly easy because I've been doing it for two and a half years, right? And uh, that was my biggest reservation. And I, I actually met with Darren, the owner, a few times um, and because most of my friends were working there. Um, at the time, and I was like, okay, well, I, I'm not. I just, I don't, I'm not very technical, and 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 I'm not sure if this really excites me. And it didn't really at the time. Mm. Um, and they said, well, it's, you know, it's, you pick it up. It's sales is sales, recruitment is recruitment. If you can recruit and you're successful in one area, you can probably do it in most areas. You just need to invest a bit of time of like learning the market. Um, so that was that. That was the first thing, and I think yeah, the the first few months. Um, you, you, you just sat there speaking to candidates to, to really gather a better understanding of the market. But I think you probably you, you, you probably get away with it a bit by, by using a few bit buzzwords in, in the first few months and, 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 yeah. and winging it a little bit. Um, but but yeah, that, that was the biggest reservation. But it, that came quite quickly. I think within I was I always say for the people that are joining here, give yourself three months. It's, and if every single day you're learning more than the day before, it's a progression. It's, it's, you're moving mm. in the right. The, the, the area so yeah it, it probably took about two or three months to me to get up to speed with some of the lingo but then again i think I'm, you're always learning so i'm still learning stuff now right yeah i think i think the especially in tech what i find when i speak to recruiters or sort of work with recruiters and stuff is like there's this sort of misconception that like you have to know as much as the people as you place or be as competent yeah. as them but you, you're never going to be as competent as them i know it looks like a, a quite interesting USP where some recruitment business is going down the route of like all of our recruiters learn to code and stuff like that, right? And and fair enough. But I think like you're, I think the actual real value that you offer and what you're talking about there is actually the insight and you're speaking to way more people like that candidate who may speak to a handful of people a lot more per week than you are than, than them. So actually the value that recruiters will always have is that, well, look, you're the fifth person I spoke to in the same position. This is what yeah. I found out so far, blah, blah, blah. I think yeah. it seems like I feel like that's a common misconception in tech where it's like, oh, I don't know. I'm I don't know anything. I'm not a techie, but it's like, well, you don't get paid to to be a techie. You you get paid to have that insight and all those things, you know. Yeah, I'd much rather a, a consultant that knew everything about a company and 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 from the company size to the progression of the company to to everything in between, right? I'd much rather that than someone be actually technically um, apt and able. Um, yeah. And with that information, then they can obviously relay that to the candidates they speak to, and then hopefully the cell is actually in the detail that they give the candidate from the knowledge of the company. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I, I just find that as sort of an interesting nuance, which sometimes people um, get worried about. But thank you for sharing that. So I guess a couple of things that I want to ask you then before we go into the sort of amber journey. So yeah. obviously, Opus is big brand. Um, well-known brand in the industry so i guess you said you had a couple of mates there but how would you sort of describe the dna of sort of opus and the dna of their culture that you think helped it or contributed it to become sort of a, a big brand as it has yeah okay so 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 the it was listed of like quality quality consultants um really? which is which is one of the things i think you know the, the, the likes of um, Chris Sheard at um, SR2 and Ryan Speeds and Nigel Romana and I could go on and on with a list of people that are just fantastic. Zeph, um, Katira, so it had some some superb people within the business. But the D the DNA was just kind of go harder and faster than anyone else. 
um, uh, in the early days, it, it kind of felt like we were we were kind of taking on the world. Um, and this is when I joined when we were, we were ten people big, just based in in Bristol. Um, and and as the as the as the company grew, we, we just managed to attract some some fantastic talent. So the actual at- atmosphere, the environment was, you know, you give us this job, um, and you put us against any other recruitment consultancy in the lands, and we'll beat you. That was the the, the kind of mm. vibe we had within the office. And usually, it kind of usually worked out that that was the case because we would go harder and faster, and we would work longer. Mm. Um, so that was the the, the the kind of vibe. But, but coupled with that. Um, Particularly from a, an early stage, we had um, we had a, like a brilliant training offer, offering. I think the, the the trainer was like employee number six within a business, which usually doesn't like happen like that, does it? Yeah. Usually you wait to get to a certain size, or you outsource the training. But the the, the trainer was, um, was, a, was a was a lady called Louise Foster, and, and she was just superb. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the training and the, and the development of people. Um, within the business, even that small was uh, was, was superb. So why did why so why do you highlight that then? Was that because it then meant that there was less people getting sort of chewed up and spat back out? Like you reduced retention. Did it mean that from like very early on, actually, that which typically doesn't happen early on, there was actually an opus way of doing things, or there was a process that a, a framework and um, a yes yeah. a playbook for people to follow. Why why do you highlight that? Because I think it's interesting. Yeah, I think I think one hundred percent. It's the it's the playbook. It's the blueprint, right? And if you, you find out what makes a successful consultant, yeah, um, and then you have that trainer that's um, that, that's uh, that's developing you on a on a consistent basis. Um, uh, yeah, that, that that seemed to be the main thing. So yeah, that, that was that for for me from my early days, particularly there where I'd probably come from um, a business where I might have a training day every. Kind of four months or so to have yeah, yeah. Con- constant training, constant feedback, constant development. That was probably the the, the, the key for my growth and development, and, and I know a lot of other lots of others as well. So j- just a quick one on this because I think this is interesting, and and we can maybe touch on this when we talk about how you've maybe tried to replicate this. But I guess for people listening to this, not everyone's going to have the luxury of having someone dedicated to L and D and get so I guess I don't know like what what would your advice be for recruiters listening to this that do have that hunger and desire to want to improve and, and it's likely that they do if they're listening to this and how would you encourage them to try and get that feedback or try and get those opportunities where they can improve despite yeah. maybe not having what you just described early on the opus? Well I mean it's something that I'm actually searching for myself is in really? terms of like having a, a training offering where myself it needs to be the right person for sure but um, I, I think it's, it, it's. I think some companies, and I'm talking maybe about business owners, might see training and and, and development as a as a, as money down the drain. Um, but in terms of what it can return you, it's obviously not right. Um, so yeah, I think it's just in terms of the investment of making sure that 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 these guys are developing. Um, that seems to be uh, that that's that that's the that's the biggest thing, and that's something I'm also looking to replicate now. You know, I'm on the I'm out there talking to, to, to people about you know bringing a, a full time tra- trainer into the business. So that that's a yeah, that's a big thing for me now still, still as well. Okay, interesting. So um, what I wanted to just ask you then was obviously a lot of recruiters want to sort of get to the position that you got to, which was sort of progressed all the way to sort of director level. And as you quite rightly said, there was a lot of great people in that business. So there would have been a lot of people that. I guess would have wanted the position that you was going for or the promotion that you was after. So again, something I'm always curious about is in an extremely competitive landscape, not just externally, but internally as well with your peers. Why do you think Tom was able to get the promotions that you got over the person sitting next to you? <laughs> well, I, I, I must admit some of the promotions were because we were, we were, we were growing at such a rapid rate. I've kind of almost, thrust into those positions because there was probably no one better at the time <laughs> <laughs> and, and truth be told I probably wasn't ready for a lot of them um uh and yeah it, it, it's yeah we moved so quickly we, we grew at such a rate um that you know before I knew I was, I was running a team of 260 come the end um so what 
what, 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 but why, why did they think of Tom? Because I think what, what's come up a few times, I understand that, but I guess okay. that surely you must have communicated at some point like that you or someone that would put your hand up if that did, I don't know. Yeah, there was definitely is. It definitely was. There was an opportunity that, that, that and, I, and, I, and I always like to be, I always like to put myself out of my, my comfort zone. If I ever if I ever feel comfortable and I'm like, well, I don't like this, I need to I need to be pushing again. So I think every single time there was an opportunity, I'd, I'd, I'd put my hand up. I wouldn't always get the opportunity, but the opportunity, I got the opportunity eventually, right? Mm. Um, so it is a case of putting your hand up and saying, yeah, give me some more responsibility. I feel like I'm in a position where I can, again, put myself out of my comfort zone a little. Okay. Interesting. So just for context, and then we'll take this into the sort of journey as a business owner. So by the time you left, you said you was managing a team of 60, did you say? Yeah. 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 60 people. And that's a per man contract and a, and a delivery team. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm assuming it sort of grew to that, but I guess what, again, what people want to know, and I'm sure you'll know is that, yeah, a lot of recruiters will be thrusted into leadership positions and quite, quite a lot of the time haven't been given any leadership training um and have to sort of work out the hard way how to get the best out of their team um yeah. which can then lead to sometimes people saying that they've got managers that micromanage them and, and all those things so i guess looking back on your leadership journey there yeah what i guess sort of thinking about people listening to this that might end up going on that journey what would your advice be for them that maybe you had to learn the hard way for people <laughs> I, going on that leadership journey yeah of course i mean i, I put my hands up i think i was a terrible manager for the first few years <laughs> <laughs> why let's talk about that because you've, you've I, kept it really positive why why do you yeah, think you was, wasn't that I great think I, potentially and I, think, I don't like to, to to blame things i don't like to blame things or people but maybe i was a like a like a product of the environment a little bit and maybe it's how i was managed or um maybe it's just a case of i uh, just i just wasn't very good my my emotional intelligence wasn't superb um i expected more of people than they probably expected of themselves um, mm. I think a lot of the time I was judging people to my standards. So yeah. I, I'd, I'd never, ever ask anyone to do something that I wouldn't do, ever. Yeah. Just, I, would, I wouldn't do it. And that is still the case now. Um, but, the, but I, you know, it's a case of if you're not doing these, and at the time, if you're not doing these stats and, and, and these inputs, and, and I am still running a team of 20, it's like, what are you doing? If you're not doing these figures and I'm running a team of 20 and doing it's like, come on. It's like, for me to do this and do the job, at a much better rate than you. It's like, come on, that, that, that's how I, that, that was that was how it was. Um, really? And again, this, yeah, as I said, I, was just, I think I think for probably the good the first like three or four years of management, I was I think I was I was awful. Um, uh, and so what back, do you have to change then? So you had to not me measure people how you would yourself. It seems oh, like as one. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. I actually again going back to the training. We actually had some. Um, some, some management training. We had a, a lot of emotional intelligence training, which which helped me no end. Um, and I think I just kind of mellowed out as a person a little bit as well yeah. over the years. So just as I got a little bit old, I was like, well, you know, if they're not going to do a hundred phone calls or send out fifteen CVs or whatever, it's like, you know, that's that's up to them. So if they want to be successful and and follow the formula that's given to them, they can do so. But you know, if they don't want to do that and they still want to knocking 10k a month doing it their way then then so be it let's embrace that and let's help them do it their way uh but again okay. that came that came with a, that came with a bit of you know a, a bit of time over, over a few years okay interesting so let, let's let's sort of take this into you starting amber then um so obviously started it in 2019 i guess what what I, i'm always interested in a lot of people may say down the pub or wherever like someday i'm going to start my own recruitment business i think yeah. a lot of people aspire to that like what what gave you the confidence to sort of take that first step yeah think? well, well I'd, I'd actually i've actually like threatened to do it before i'd uh, been in a position a couple of times where um one i handed my notice in a few years before um and, and didn't quite follow through with it um well it took a counter offer uh, yeah, yeah, you could say that. There was there was a little bit more to it, to it than Fair. that, but <laughs> there was a little bit more to it. Um, which was which looking back at the time, I probably wasn't quite ready. Um right. and I was I was decent on the, the billing side and, and running a team by that by that by that time. But in terms of the other stuff, the the the, the running the business side, 
um, I had I was completely clueless. So, um, yeah. So, what was your question again? So, so basically, I was just interested. Like a lot of people have the idea or the aspirations to start yeah, a business, yeah, yeah. but how? Not many people take that first step. You know, and we'll talk. I know yeah. we're going to talk about you being sort of invested to to start and stuff. Yeah. But I guess that could be part of it. But what? Yeah, I don't then, know what. How do you take that first step? Yeah, but, and then and then it was because I was there for nearly ten years. I was I was like it's kind of all I all I ever know or knew. Mm. And um, it, it actually the, the process happened over probably like a six month period for me. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't like a snap decision, right? Let's go. And do this. I started thinking about it. Um, I knew I always wanted to do it at some point, and I knew um, that that. That, that it would come a day when I, when I had to do it. So it, I started thinking about it, and, and actually, I was quite vocal about, about it. I actually went to my manager and said, "Listen, this is this is my situation. This is how I'm feeling at the moment. Um, you know, if, we've had a good, great year last year, and I'm in a position where I think it's time now where um, I, I need to like, spread my wings and, and start my own, start my own business." So I was like quite vocal about the, the whole scenario, and then. A couple of months went by and it just felt more and more like the time was mm. right. Um, yeah, so so it was it was yeah, it was a it was a slower process, like a drip feed of like over six months of just going yeah. into the business. So I was like, right now I'm definitely completely ready. There's a few things that were happening that I wasn't, you know, I didn't really agree with that much, but that's you know, that's that's it was beyond my control. And mm. I'm, like, right, I'm now ready to make a decision that, you know, let's let's go have a look and, and see what's uh, see what's what. Okay. So just to be clear then, because I know we spoke about this before. So obviously, before you then took the leap, you had been you hadn't been on the tools for how long? Well, I'd, yeah, probably been a, probably been about two or three years. Um, yes, I, I, I might you know, do the the odd close in the office, like a Hollywood close. Oh, here he is. Yeah, I'd, uh, <laughs> the, the work, working the two phones and, <laughs> and whatnot. I've, I've actually done that a few times, but so, so <laughs> I, I, I still like kept my my nose in, so to speak. But um, yeah, haven't been yeah. actively like yeah yeah, yeah. No, okay so it's been, been a couple been of years yeah so so obviously you've been um and and it'd be great just to, to start here so you you've obviously got a relationship with an investor that's that's helped you supported you start amber yeah yeah so could you just talk a bit about that i guess one how did you meet this investor yeah um how does it actually work i think as i shared with you before we went on to this i think a lot of people always i don't know i feel like from the conversation i have just have a quite a sort of negative view of if i if i go with an investor or i go with someone that's going to support me start my recruitment business aren't they going to take all my money um yeah. so yeah how did you how did you meet your investor and sort of how have you how does it actually work and then we'll talk about the journey so far yeah well, well first of all um I, i'm kind of in a position where i've got three kids and um an expensive wife and <laughs> and I, I was kind of living to my means, and I didn't have many savings because we're just because I'm a recruit because someone some of us don't, right? So I was like, <laughs> I need to find someone that could help support me because I need to have an income, like a basic income that is X amount. So that was like one of my first things. Like I want to go and do it, but I don't have the ability, means, backing, family connections, whatever you want to call it, to be able to to do it from scratch for myself. Um. So so when I was out talking to to other people i also checked around the market and i saw other people set up and i was like okay well that person seemed to have set up and their investor looks good so when i started looking it was actually for a rector rec um funny enough and uh he put me in touch with, with with a few different investors and i also wanted to i, I also wanted the, an investor that could um like leave me to my own devices a little bit and i was prepared to, yeah. to back me when when you know, and not really ask many questions. Um, so that, again, I was probably asking for the world. I was asking for a, like a, a decent base salary that I could take within the position. I was asking for you know, a decent percentage, um, and then maybe um, maybe a, a company that could offer me the the ability to to bring a few people into the business pretty quickly. Um, so that yeah, that that was my. That, that 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 was that was the situation. So I went on to to a few people in Bristol and, and had conversations. Um, and then you know stumbled upon uh, the, the the investor I had now, and I sat down with him and I said, "Well, this is what this is what I'm after. These are not my demands, but the, the, these are the things yeah, yeah. that that I'm really looking for and, and support and, and and help from a uh, from an investor and, and ended up to where I am now." 
Amazing. And would you mind, look, you don't have to go into the exact details, but I think it's just good context for people. So I think what I took from that is you was really honest with yourself. The fact that yeah. your circumstances and stuff, well, actually, look, I'm not going to be bitter about this. I actually, it's actually the, the best option possible for me to start a recruitment business is having someone, having someone involved. And then it seemed like you quite quickly worked out what you wanted that relationship to look like in terms yeah. of you wanted autonomy, you wanted to, yeah, you know, you knew what you wanted, right? Um, yeah. So I guess the, just the final context in this, which I think is useful is like, yeah, how, how does it sort of simply work then in terms of you owning um, the, the business? How does that work? And how, just how does that relationship work, if you wouldn't mind sharing? Yeah. No, of course. So, so I started off on a percentage. Um, yeah. Uh, with, with with the investor in it. and it wasn't really like a big negotiation it, it was actually i thought i thought like extremely fair it's like okay well here's your percentage yeah and your percentage grows to to 50 percent after you hit uh two milestone targets and the two milestone targets are you know money kept within the business so nothing else no, no retention no no head crown growth no nothing it's like you hit these two targets of cash within the business then you get your two kickers and two that 50 yeah. percent and when you get to fifty percent, um, it will be you'll be in a position then where um, if you wanted to in the future take more from us, you can. We'll talk about a, a, a buyout for, for for further percentage. But on the flip side, what we'll offer you is um, a free office for a period of time. Um, we'll offer you some support and money to 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 for yourself and to bring other people into the business. Um, and um, we'll also offer uh, offer offer you. It was like twelve months of like free back back end support, operational support um, from the finance team, the HR team, the legal team, which we which we needed the first the first few months, um, <laughs> and, and and whatnot. So so uh, looking at the deal in terms of the, what was on offer and what they gave to me, um, these are the things that I was nervous about um, mm. that, that I probably really needed, like just little things like doing terms or yeah yeah. Stuff responding to a legal letter or um, finance or contractor finance or all this, all this kind of stuff. And they said, well, well, we'll sort all of that for you within the deal for the first 12 months. So yeah, that was the, uh, that was, that was the deal. No, thank you for that. And I think what, I think what's great about that, it seems like is it's just it's super simple um, and not complicated. Like there isn't these like weird loopholes that you have to get an NFI <laughs> yeah. to X amount and all these things. So I guess, Final thing on this then, like how, yeah. so what would you say have been one, like what has actually, so we've spoken about what you wanted it to be like, you've explained the, some of the real positives. What yeah. has the actual experience been like so far? Like you shared what you wanted to be like, what has it actually been like? And then two, what would you say so far have been the sort of most positive impacts in actually going down that path to start your own recruitment business and grow your own recruitment business? Yeah, so, so so first first of all, it's been it's been re it's been really exciting. I feel like I'm not too cheesy, like reborn again, but I kind of yeah. do feel like that a little bit. I felt like I've I've got my got my edge back. Not that I think I may have lost it, but it's just in a different way. Yeah. Um. So the it's, yeah, it's been an incredibly exciting journey that to, to get back into a position where you're actually recruiting. I've always loved um, to recruit. Um. It's it's, it's always got me extremely excited about having a project and being able to fill that project. Yeah. Um, so actually going back to, to, to recruiting was, 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 was superb. Um, and then, in, uh, and even though we've came for a recession, so we actually didn't get our team like fully up and running until uh, January and then come March coronavirus hit. So we actually only really <laughs> had one like decent month of recruitment um, of, of, of fee generation, if you like in the February uh, before March came, and and obviously the, there wasn't much to be done between March and probably June, right? And again, going back to picking the right investor, the, the, what we we're talking about before is you know we were we were funding like six people's like six decent people's salaries, um, and there was there was never a question, not not once was well, did, did did the investor come knocking and saying what you know what what we're doing about this? There, there was always confidence wow. that. You'd get we'd get back to the position where I'd go okay well we're back here now let's let's just make sure we go harder and faster than than uh, than we did before kind of thing so yeah in ter terms of that and the, the, the positive stuff oh there's been there's been so many like different positive wins that we've had um since we've been kind of back from like i'd say i think it was like june the 
Junis or Juno Juno August. Yeah. Um, they, they also we've grown for a pandemic. Um, we've, we've had some superb talent. Um, in terms of why why I was looking to come close to this investor, he he owns a company called Sandersons, um, and they're a delivery focused or delivery model business. Um, where my whole career had been spot business. Um, I think in one year I did like fifty odd deals within a year, and and it was with forty eight different clients. So it, wow. it was proper, proper spot business, <laughs> which I knew was a, a limiting factor for my for, for my personal development. So I, I wanted to align myself with a business where they did completely the opposite, um, and they got in got, got in with with a few clients and landed and expanded and and developed those the, those accounts out. So it was really good to come into that environment and, and also like almost like learn a different way to recruit, yeah, uh, to provide a, a superb service over a long kind of period of time. So. Yeah, that, that's probably the, the the biggest wins. We've got some superb clients. We've we've done incredibly well. Um, we've grown as a business, and you know the future is looking good at the moment. So how um, just just it helps with context, and then we'll sort of break this down a bit before we finish. What how how did you do revenue wise first year, gross profit wise first year then? Yeah, well, revenue wise, like gross profit for the first year runs from um, uh, July to June. We were down hundred oh, okay. k. We were down hundred k right. uh, within the within the first twelve months, and obviously that was towards the end of the lockdown. So we'd really, really been going for um, outside of a lockdown, if you like, been been, been for a couple for a couple of months, mm. um, and then um, since we've come back um, from from that, um, the GP's been like close to like uh, seven hundred thousand. Wow. Um, from uh, from from June, um, what, you know, we're we're, we're averaging um, like a hundred k months um, uh, with a team of well, it, what, to start off it was like five billers, and we've now grown to, to to eleven in total. So, yes, it would. Uh, we've 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 kind of come through that hundred k down and more up. So we've had a we've yeah. had a really good run of things. Amazing, great work. So, I guess a couple, couple of things that I'm keen to un- unpack here then before we finish. Yeah. So, I guess firstly, I guess firstly, because I think a lot of people think about this, like when you thought about when you started forming the plan for Amber and these things, like did you spend much time thinking about your USP or like I don't know what no. was your differentiator? No, do, do you know what? That, that's something I'm struggling with still now. Really? I'll, I'll, I'll put Fair. my hands up. Yeah, I, I, I know what I know what we're good at, but I, I, I don't. I also don't want to feel like a phony and and give a story which I don't fully commit or believe. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I, I, yeah. I think everyone's everyone's looking for an angle at the moment, and it's a you mm. know, we do this and we do that and we sponsor this. It's like all very good causes, I'm sure, but but I want to I want to I want to be able to to be in a position where I go, okay, well. Here's here's what we do. Here's what we're good at, and this is our USP. Um, you know, the the, the, the USPs I'm going to say are going to be the same as what everyone says. We do, we're just yeah. we're, we're, we're vertical market market specialists. The people I have within the business are just they're just the best at what they do, um, and we we have really really tight patches in terms of the tech we use. But that's the same as everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair. No, I, I, I appreciate I appreciate the honesty because um, I think a lot of people, especially early on in the journey, they that I think they can spend a lot of time thinking about what that unique thing is. But I think at the same time, yeah, you know, I respect that you're still working it out. But you you yeah. you do know what you can do really well, which is be inch wide, mile deep, and yeah. get some really good people that that know their patch. I guess the thing that I wanted to ask you then next it was a close second was like. The most, the, the sort of always the challenge in recruitment businesses that want to grow is hiring people for their own business, right? Yeah. Which, again, I always say is the most ironic thing, right? So, yeah, yeah. like, you've got some great people on the bus. Yeah. It seems quite clear. I always see the pictures of you guys with, I don't know, transfer deadline day, like <laughs> bottle of champagne or whatever. Do you know what I mean? So, it always seems yeah. like you guys are on, on the positive mark. So, I guess. What do you think, and this could be very reliant on you, or whatever, but whatever comes up for you, like what do you think you've done well to get people on the bus, considering you know how many recruitment businesses your guys could join that aren't yours? Yeah. Well, I, I think first of all, I've got I've got a superb team. That really helps, right? 
um, in terms of the, the the characters we have on the team, in terms of of um, how they are as people, that the, the, the just the brilliant bunch of, of of people, which I think always helps when a, a person comes in for an interview and a chat, and and that they're, they're dealing with good people that are doing well and happy and enjoy their job. That that that's always a always a thing. I've always think that um, that actually like internal recruitment has been has been my strong point. Okay. Um, it's something that 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 I, that I to grow opus the way we grew it uh, grew it. Um, I was just yeah I I just I probably spent about fifty percent of my time out there talking to people, understanding the market, mapping map, mapping, knowing who's good, um, and and then I, I'd imagine um, you know through my through my experience, um, I'd like to think that I've developed some people along the way, and you'd also like to think that you know Bristol's quite a small place, and people start to talk, and and all of a sudden it's like you probably get a bit of a reputation for for someone that's that's done good within the business, and and that also helps as well, right? Um, so yeah, I think um, I, I think the, the the key thing is is making sure that the people I have in the in the business are are enjoying it and they're having fun, and um, when they sit down and speak to people. Um, in terms of in terms of interviews, they're, they're giving a, a good um, a good account of of where we're going as a as a company. So, you, so you just what, I guess what I'm interested in, and you just said that it's probably one of your strong points of speaking to people and internal group and these things. So, I guess you just shared with us that you are definitely still working out your USP and these things. So, I guess what I'm just interested and curious on is like what what was you selling to these people? What was it that yes, you've got you may have developed these people in the past but i guess i'm just interested in like what was the sell what did you get these people bought in to yeah yeah so so first of all um when i first came that the first few people were, were known to me that that, that okay, fair. Before, so i think in like first hand um if they were looking to leave the business i, I had a presentation on a laptop and, and i think i probably spent the first month just presenting this presentation of you know what we're doing and where we're looking to go yeah. Um, so, so that probably helped. I, I knew a lot of their motivations, a lot of their drivers, um, and I could, I could, I could paint the picture of where they were going to go as a, as an individual within the business. So that probably helped. Um, in terms of the other people, it's, like, it's just a lot of honesty. Um, yeah. I think if, if you call a spade a spade, I think, I think people um, that they know when someone's bullshitting, and, and they can see mm. right through you. So. If you're not good at something, or you think there's a, a weakness, or you think there's something that needs to be improved, you, you've got to tell them. Um, but you've also got to tell them what you're going to do about changing it and making it, making it, making it good. For example, mm. um, so that, that I think that's also helped me. Um, I've painted okay. the picture of where I'd like to be as a as a as a business, and, and also the, the mentorship and the development they're going to get from from me and the other people within the off, in the office as well. Okay, and then. The, the other thing that I want to just, just because you would have done a lot of this, I'm assuming, at Opus and, and now as you continue to do it to, to Gramba, but like people want to know, like what, so it seems like, have you typically in Amber, have you hired experienced people? Uh, I, I make, a mix of the two. Um, okay. Yeah, a mix of the two. Like, I've uh, One of my hires, one of my first hires was, I've got a static caravan done in Devon Cliffs. Um, and and he sold me the caravan. I was like, I was like, mate, you've, you're you're not too bad at this. You ever thought about coming into recruitment? I was like, well, <laughs> I've, I've, I've thought about. It. I said, like, well, get yourself up in, and we'll uh, we'll have an interview and, and, and get you through the door. So it's like spotting potential in in people yeah. that just don't have recruitment um, recruitment experience. So there, there, there's a mix between experience and non experience. Fair. The, the the reason why I ask is because people want to know Tom and. People want to know, Tom, basically, like, what is it that you actually personally look for in a new hire and not not the sort of high level, classic, like hard working, all that stuff, I guess. What has been typically the sort of secret source that you've looked for in people that, yeah, has ended up working out? Or what, what is it that you truly actually look for in people? Like, honestly, someone that can give me six months is, okay. is usually, is usually the, the, the key thing. If, if I like it, I think for most people, um, if you give me six months of your of, of, of your time, um, I'll be able to turn them into a consistent performing uh, biller. Mm. So, so that's like the key thing. Like, are they are they going to run at the first sign of trouble? Um, 
are they going to be in a position where things don't go quite their way over a month period and they, they don't do a deal or they have a drop out they're going to they're going to leave and go somewhere else that that's the that's the key thing for me so yeah the the six months give me six months of your of your like professional life um and i think i can i can turn you into into a, that that's the usual thing that runs through my head and also like okay. are they a nice person and all that kind of stuff yeah. um but, but that's that's the key one for me yeah, fair. And then look, in your in your we we always speak a lot about getting new people, but don't always tend to speak about keeping people. I guess in your sort of journey so far, what what things have you maybe at Opus or what you continue to do at Amber? Like, what sort of things do you really try and do as a leader or put in place to to keep your best people from yeah, from leaving? And yeah, I mean, that, that, there's a lot of things I'd like to to do more outside of obviously having coronavirus. But in terms of what we've done so far, that it's we, we've we've had um, a trainer come in to to, to do uh, extra training and, and development sessions, um, giving people more responsibility of taking on um, that 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 next step of their career, um, and and lots of like fun stuff outside of work again about outside of coronavirus, but just makes making sure that they're enjoying themselves, having a having a, a good time because it can be it can be the hardest job in the world sometimes. And particularly, I think that kind of team lead, uh, principal consultant to team lead role, where you're just taking on a whole new skill set, uh, just making sure that, that they're having as much fun as they possibly can. Yeah, fair enough. So I guess I just feel like you've been like really positive. <laughs> you're obviously someone that's got a really positive mindset, which I, I, I absolutely I, love. I, I, yeah, I, I, I you, you, you do struggle to find me in a, in a, on a, on a, on a, on a neck. I think that's again, one really? of the things, you know what I said to you about having, having that, having that attitude of like leaving at the door. If you have a bad day. Yeah, of course I've had some, yeah, bad yeah. Days. I've had some, I've had some terrible days. Um, but you can't, I, you just can't let it hold you with it. With, we're recruitment consultants. A bad day in, in a, as a, as a recruiter, someone leaves your business or someone doesn't take your offer or someone drops out. Right. It's, yeah. It's like no one's dying. We're not. We're not. We're not surgeons. It's like not perspective. It's perspective, isn't it? It's like crisis. Like you know, I was, I was an insurance broker for three years. Do you know what I mean? It's like you know, I had to read off a script. I'm now in a position. Yeah, oh my god, that was grim. <laughs> yeah, it was horrible. So <laughs> yeah, 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 I am positive. The, yeah, the, the reason why I ask is because like people always message me and people want to know like Tom, what was your, what were your darkest days? What were like, what were the biggest slumps that you had that? that you got through and how you got through it. But it seems like you've really honed that muscle of like today's a new day perspective. Yeah. I don't know. I'm yeah. sure you've had to help people get through that. I've had, yeah, I've, I've had, I've had some, some, some really bad days. I've had like bad days when people have had, you know, really, really bad news and, um, and just kind of like processing and dealing that with them together as a, as a, as a, as a couple. So I've had, we had a commission change at my last gaff and and it was a terrible day for me because I was looking at I was going, how can I put a spin on this? It's like how can I how can I sell this? Because I'd like I, I like to, you know usually with a commission you can go actually okay we're changing it here but here's the carrot. I was like I, I, I didn't think there was a carrot so I was like how am I going to be in a position where I can sell this and retain people in the business and then my top biller the same day says I'm off and leaves that day. So wow. that, that was a bad. That was a bad day. Do you know, I was like, oh.
<laughs> yeah. Oh, mate. That's... There you go. That, that was my worst yeah. day. Just cutting out that. That's fine. <laughs> well, um, mate, it's still recording. So let, we'll wrap this up in like five minutes. I've just got like five yeah. final questions. Is that okay? Yeah, of course, mate. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> wait, I'll just, I can edit this bit out. Just had some connection issues, but obviously, Tom, you were sharing that, yeah, you've obviously had some very bad days, like your top biller leaving after changing the commission structure. So I guess we were just keen to hear how you've continued to get better with that muscle of like, right, today's a new day. So I wasn't sure what you was going to sort of say to finish uh, that. I think I think the muscle of today's a new day and also f- like feeling it is like, you know, the, 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 it gets easier. You hear it time and time again, right? And every time it gets a little bit easier, the rejection, the no's, that the bad things are happening. And you did, I don't think you take it so personally come the end. I think the first few times you do take it personally, go, you know, it's 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 you know, it's, it's because of me or they're leaving me or, or, or whatever it may be. Um, to to now, it's a case of just like that's just what happens. So just you know, just you know, just have to live with it. <laughs> So, so I've got five final questions I'm going to ask you, but before I do, I'm interested to get your thoughts on this question, which is, like, in your opinion, what do you think is the most important action or KPI that contributes to recruiter success? Um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, um, I, I think recruitment is a contact sport. So I think the, the, the most important action is um, is speaking to as many people for um, as possible as clients and candidates as much as much as much as you possibly can getting on the phone and, and speaking to people it's pretty old school right but I think that that's that's the key thing to uh, speaking to can- candidates speaking to clients I, I can't nice. put any yeah fair so final questions first one yeah if you could if you could change the industry what would you improve? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I just, this, just the, the overall standard. Um, I think recruiters get a quite a bad rep, um, and we're probably tarnished with a brush of, um, you know, the, the the guys that aren't so good. So, yeah, for for, for me, it's, yeah, just making sure that I don't know how you could do that. Um, and this is why <laughs> this is why I quite like the. Uh, the recessions because I think it's almost like a bit of a, a recruitment cull. Um, I think at some points, like every man and his dog is a recruiter. Um, and I think sometimes when it gets to um, it gets to a recession, um, the, the, the the people that are faking recruitment probably don't make it. Um, and I think just because of that, the actual industry standard goes up a little bit. But yeah, that that, that would be that that would be how I, I don't know how I'd improve it. Maybe a recruitment exam or something of the like, but yeah, that's just a, a better all round, um, yeah, better all round standard. Yeah. Um, what what book have you read that has had the biggest impact on you, or something that you've listened to? If you're not a reader, just what what have you yeah. consumed that's had a big impact on you? Um, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd I recently listened to the the, the Gypsy King's book. Um, it's, what book's uh, that? It's a, the, the Gypsy Kings book, um, Tyson. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah, I, I, I'm in, in in terms of books, I, I'm I'm probably more of a listener than the reader, um, but yeah, I think more like motivational um, uh, support and and you know how people battle through, you know, some of the darker times and how they come out uh, come out on top. So that that yeah, those, those types of books are are um, yeah, are fancy. So, so this ties quite nicely, actually, into a question that Zef sent me, <laughs> which is he, he wanted to know why you didn't become a full-time boxer after all the success you had on amateur circuit. Well, yeah, but that's a very, very good question, Zef. Very good question. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, well, funny enough, I, I did this boxing thing. And listen, I've, I've never done boxing in my life. Um, and it was, I think it was Zero to Hero, and it was like 40 people, and they got paired up together. Um, yeah. and, and they could, they made me the captain for that, not because I was the best boxer, I was I was a pile of shit. Um, but but again, I was I was the person that put my hand up first every time they did something. I was like, right, I'll try that, I'll stick myself out of my comfort zone. Um, but you know, it was, it was the, my bout, my bout reads one and oh, and uh, and retired. <laughs> 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 Love that. Um, what what did you spend your first biggest commission paycheck on? Um, I actually 
it, it was actually like three months into um, into my time at, at, time at Opus. I'd, um, I had like a, a sixty thousand pound month. Um, it was like it was incredible. It, was, it just everything went my way. Um, and well, I, I, there was a couple of things I did with that. Well, one was that there was a, a person that worked at a previous company that said um, he said I'll never amount to anything and I'll never I never I wow. never put the, the big paychecks in. Um, and so the, one of the first things I did with, with that was I, I sent him a, I sent him an email. So hello, my, his name was Ben. I said, hello, Ben, how you doing, mate? Um, and he's like, yeah, no, no, no problem, mate. How, how are you getting on? I said, I said, uh, and it's quite, quite a crude thing, but I said, like, listen, mate, it's my 16 grand paycheck. You um, <laughs> that was one of my first, my first ads. And, and, that, and that filled me with like so much, like, I know it's just saying it, but that filled me with so much joy being able to, to prove someone wrong, right? Um, yeah, yeah, fair. No, thank you for sharing that. Respect. With with the page, <laughs> I actually, yeah, actually, uh, actually booked a, a honeymoon and and paid for my paid for my wedding um, with that paycheck. So yeah, that was that Love was that. the first. So, for, for, final one, Tom. What what's the uh, what's the ultimate goal for your recruitment career? I I don't know. I again, I I like I I don't know. I'm like what I'm at the moment. I'm enjoying myself. I'm enjoying myself and it's going well and um and 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 I'm enjoying the ride. So ideally what where would I like to go? I I don't I don't really have a clue, have a clue, but I'm I'll, I'll keep I'll keep on the ride until I'm not having fun, right? Um mm. so where could I go? Well, I'd like to be in a position where we have uh feet on the ground and and, and expand our Manchester office to have an office in in, in London to to build this office. Um uh, and in terms of like the end game, uh, yeah, I, could, could I be in a position where I become I could become, I could become hands off and start up a career in golf? Or I'm not really not sure. We, we, we'll see. We'll see where it takes me. But I, I, don't, I don't really think too far ahead, and I think that can be dangerous. Um, at the moment, I, I know where I, you know where, where I am, and I know I'm enjoying myself. So yeah, we'll see where it takes me. No, I love that, Tom. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for being so candid, honest. I love your positive attitude. And really excited to see where sort of Amber go over the next couple of years. So thank you for uh, coming on and, and sharing your story. Thanks so much, mate. Appreciate your time. Thank you.